expectancy decreases. When do we expect that? When, uh, for example, uh, uh, climate gets drier, or for example, you uplift the Altiplano where there's no precipitation on top of it anymore, and then, uh, then you basically shut down erosion. And in these cases, what we would expect, uh, because we have the same amount of mass going through, but slower erosion, the, the origin grows wider. Right? It grows wider until it reaches a steady state, and we would expect a decrease in erosion rate in this case. We can also grow the origin wider by increasing the accretionary flux and maintaining uh, the erosional efficiency fixed. Right? So for a fixed erosional efficiency, if we increase the mass flux into the origin, we should expect it to grow outwards right? and get taller, get thicker, get wider. And so this would predict an increase in erosion rate and uplift. And so why am I telling you all of this? Because if, if what we're seeing, this is from an uh, analytical model solving for that mass balance equation uh, and coupling it to erosion loss. And so what they, say, what they tell us is that actually climate would affect the shape and the overall mass of mountains. And so um, there is empirical appeal to this, right? Um, if we look at, for example, porphyry coppers that are deposits that are spread out um, over the globe, um, it turns out that they kind of form at a kind of a fixed, uh, fixed depth, about two kilometers, give or take, within the crust. And these porphyries over time, they, they get to the surface. They are exhumed because there is erosion going on on top of the, on top of the mountains. And so um, people have looked at this and compiled the ages of porphyry coppers that are, that are at the surface today and, um, and converted that into an exhumation rate. So how fast it took from that two kilometer emplacement to, for it to reach uh, the surface today. And what they have seen here, according, uh, for example, in this paper, they see that the exhumation rate of these porphyry coppers are actually uh, kind of um, not, not greatly, but at least weakly correlated with precipitation rates. And so um, what they, at least we would expect with an increase in, in precipitation uh, from this, this, uh, this marker, we would see increases in erosion. There are other uh, really good examples, for example, from, from the Himalaya and the southern island of New Zealand. Um, in New Zealand, what we see, for example, here, where um, the, the New Zealand Southern Alps uh, uh, are spread throughout here, this, the Southern Island, um, with the westerlies coming into from, from the west side of the mountain range, it focuses all the precipitation on one side, while the eastern side of those mountains are actually drier. And when we look at erosion, so this is a map of rainfall. When we look at erosion, um, the arrows here indicate the amount of uh, sediment that's coming out of these uh, rivers. And um, they're actually putting out a lot more sediment on the western side, where it is much wetter uh, compared to the eastern side. Um, so this also supports this idea that, yeah, perhaps uh, rainfall uh, induces higher ero erosion rates, right? Um, in the Himalaya, this is also interesting. So imagine where uh, the, the Himalayan mountains are to the right of this graph over here, right? And we're coming off of it uh, into the foreland to the, to the south of, of the Himalayan mountains. And what we see as we come out of the mountains is that precipitation increases uh, up to a maximum. And within this zone of increase in precipitation, uh, this gray band here is showing us the, the amount of constant and high exhumation rates uh, as, as constrained from uh, fish and track ages, um, presumably, I think, in zircons. And, um, and so there is high exhumation where it rains the most in the Himalaya as well. And so this is interesting. So there's this spatial correlation of, of erosion and uh, rainfall rates. And the other things that we see around the globe is, for example, uh, the coincidence of uh, glacial cirques and uh, the heights of mountains, uh, in, in, at least in the Cordilleran origins. And um, so throughout the globe, we have here, for example, the mean cirque heights uh, over different latitudes uh, coinciding, for example, with this gray 
uh, band here that shows us what it shows us the equilibrium line altitude. This is the altitude where glaciers are the most effective at, at, at eroding their bases. And so uh, we see Cirque heights coinciding with that. And then uh, we also see that the, the topography from all the way from Alaska to Patagonia, we see that they coincide with changes, at least spatially, the pattern coincides very well with the changes in the ELA, the equilibrium line altitudes. And you put that in a, in a bivariate plot, what you see is that there is a, a very strong relationship between the snow line altitude and the elevation of these mountains globally. So there is a pretty strong correlation and most of, so for example, from, from basically what would be the Cirque heights up to the maximum elevation, uh, it's about uh, the modern snow line plus or minus uh, uh, the last glacial maximum elevation. And so, so there's a lot of appeal to this and such so that, um, uh, for example, this, this paper back in 2013 looked at exhumation rates around the globe and concluded that over the last two million years, there's been an acceleration of, uh, of erosion rates as the climate has been cooling uh, through the late Cenozoic. And so, um, so this, all of this would point to this direction where climate cooling, uh, glacial activity, and precipitation would actually induce faster erosion rates, uh, presumably even faster than what tectonics could take care of uh, in terms of adding mass to the system. But then we look at other uh, proxies, right? So we have this proxy over here over the last two, uh, 10 million years. Uh, this is a proxy using ber meteoric beryllium-10, which tracks changes in erosion rates on the continents. And uh, what these proxies tell us is that there's no change in erosion rates, uh, at least on average, over the continents throughout the last 10 million years. So we have these competing, uh, competing proxies, uh, and for the most part, we have a lot of empirical, at least spatial coincidence of erosion and climate. And so so the question that I, uh, I proposed to talk about today was about, um, was about if, if these, uh, there is a climate control on how efficient erosion is on the surface, then can it actually control the heights and form basically of mountains? So both the heights and asymmetries of, of origins that are uh, growing uh, over subduction zones today. And so today I'll talk to you about exactly that in two parts. I'm first going to address uh, the asymmetry of mountains, and here I'm going to talk specifically about the Andes, and um, and then I'm going to move on to tackling this this question about mountain heights. And in both cases, I'm going to be uh, uh, trying to address this this possible effect of climate on um, the evolution of mountains. And so. Um, it's important, let me add this graph here, it's important to think about climate and mountains because mountains, as, as you probably know, they grow tall enough to block atmospheric currents. And when they do that, um, they actually drive orographic effects of precipitation, right? And so if, for example, we look at the Andes over here and draw a cross section, what we see in gray on this graph, <clears throat> this is a, a function of distance, Forgive me, it's in Portuguese here, but uh, it's a function of, of distance. And so we have the Altiplano over here. And as we reach the other side, because of the high precipitation coming from, from the Amazon region, we get a, a strong uh, rainfall effect here, orographic effect, focusing most of the rain on the eastern side of, these, of this mountain range, and while the western side remains dry. And so um, some, some folks have done some modeling of this uh, kind of situation of orographic effects uh, in, in a, a mountain range uh, simulating both erosion on the surface and deformation, uh, the distribution of deformation within the crust. And what they see in this model, this is a rather extreme case where they modeled where um, only one side of this mountain would erode at a time. What they did here is, so in the colored domain, you see the, the crust, and the top of this colored domain is uh, the topography. And so we have the topographic divide place right there in the middle. Um, where, where erosion is being focused is exactly where the wind is coming from, 
And so uh, just by changing the side of where wind is hitting the mountain, without changing anything about the subduction, uh, the polarity of subduction here, what you get is this uh, change in the, mo the amount of exhumation that happens, so where it is happening within the origin. And so uh, with the uh, wind coming from the west side of this mountain, this gray grid is showing us that most of the exhumation is coming out of the west side. As we change it to the other side, uh, exhumation follows. Um, do I hear a question? Is there, is there a question coming up? No? Um, just feel free to stop me, uh, really. And, um, and so just by changing the wind direction, you can get a change in where exhumation is occurring. And also what the color uh, domain is showing is actually strain rate, so deformation within the crust. And we can see just by doing that too, we actually change the locus of deformation within the crust. This is what these modeling uh, uh, exercises would tell us. And so it's interesting to think about the Andes uh, in, with this in mind, because um, what we get, for example, uh, throughout the Andes is uh, up in the northern part of the Andes, we have this high, strong orographic effect with higher amounts of rain in the eastern side of the mountains. Um, and within the same subduction zone, uh, when we reach the southern part of the Andes, there's actually a, a reverse uh, situation where there's higher amount of rain on the west side. Uh, and that is because of the atmospheric currents. And so back in 2001, Montgomery et al. looked at this and um, looked at the distribution of mass in the Andes on the first panel. And they also looked at the distribution of precipitation along the Andes. And so we see that there is actually an inverse relationship here where there's no rain, there's higher topography with more rain on both extremes uh, with uh, lower topography in the Andes. And so they use this distribution to calculate this excess erosion or erosional intensity. And they see that there is actually a correlation between these erosion uh, metrics uh, and precipitation. So they use this to actually propose that perhaps climate controls uh, the distribution of mass. So this is a fraction of the origin that is west of the divide. And they see that at times it's west of the divide, at times it's east of the divide, and that coincides with where uh, rainfall is occurring uh, on either side of the mountains. And so they propose that perhaps precipitation controls the asymmetry and the distribution of mass about the Andean divide, right? But we, before we actually understand, you know, if, if climate actually can move mountains in that way, we need to know what causes them to be asymmetric to begin with. And it turns out that some mountains can, can be asymmetric by nature. And so if, if we have, for example, a tectonic control of asymmetry, uh, this situation is usually the case when we have horizontal advection of mass which is generally the case when we have uh, lots of faults, faulting in along uh, thick skin and thin skin deformation forming uh, uh, fold and thrust belts, for example. So as the origin is expanding, it's actually uh, causing some amount of uh, horizontal advection. And so as we increase the ratio of this vertical uplift to the horizontal velocity, we actually can get asymmetric mountains without any anything without having anything to do with climate and so on the other hand if in the other extreme if we have models like this where you know you only erode one side where it rains the most then you can also drive some amount of asymmetry of these mountains and then we reach this situation where we have to think about the differences, um, the different models of origins that we have. And so we can think of origins either as a fixed width, as a box, where uh, all the uplift is, is going in this box and this box is not changing in size. Or we can think of it as an orogenic wedge with nice tapers and a, a thicker part of the crust and sort of a triangle shape. If we have a fixed width origin like this, most of the accretion that enters this box is actually converted into pure vertical uplift. We have situations like this in the Andes where, for example, 
We have normal faults in the beginning, uh, early history of the Andes that were then uh, compressed again to then just pop up a whole uh, mountain range. So this case, uh, in this case, if we have pure vertical uplift, if we change the direction of wind, if we change um, the position where, uh, the, if we actually drive in orographic effect is what I'm trying to say, uh, we can start with, an, with a uh, symmetric mountain as this faded uh, black line over here. And if we impose an orographic effect, the wetter side actually being more efficient will drive erosion uh, and, um, and cause the migration of that topographic divide towards the dry side. And the dry side will experience surface uplift, right? So the surface will get higher. And um, this is predicted in erosion uh, models. So the stream power erosion model, this is just an equation. If you're curious about it, you can ask about it later. Um, if just by changing the distribution of precipitation, so here we have on the left a model with uniform precipitation and on the right with asymmetric precipitation, what you can see is with the same amount of uplift, just by increasing the precipitation in the lower part of the landscape, we can erode at the same rate, we can uplift at the same rate, but the topography is actually lower, okay? Uh, and it turns out that this is a negative feedback where you uh, don't have to change the erosion rate, but if you make erosion more efficient, all you need is a lower topography to, to compensate for that. And so this is exactly that effect that causes the migration of that, that divide uh, in this pure vertical uplift scenario. But for the most part, the Andes is not like that. The Andes uh, probably behaves as, uh, as, or is shaped uh, more or less like, like so in this graph over here, resembling uh, an orogenic wedge for that matter. And in these, uh, in these cases, we have two different scenarios, one where we have fixed tapers and the other where we actually can change that taper, basically changing the slope of the mountains over here. If we cannot change the slope of the mountain, all that happens with changing uh, erosional efficiencies is different, uh, the origin grows in, uh, or shrinks depending on how you change precipitation. And it turns out that what matters the most is how much rain happens in the retro arc, in the, the back arc part of the mountains. Because um, the accretionary flux actually drives the polarity of mass addition. And so uh, we have an eastward preference to the particle paths uh, from the mass that is being added from the, the subducting plate onto the overriding plate. So it turns out that if we have a back arc that is dry, it could drive an increase in the origin. So uh, if we start with a smaller origin, uh, like the faded uh, gray line over here, if we make the back arc side dry, it actually will drive an increase. And in the opposite direction, it will drive a, a shrinking of the origin. In the le left case, with the less efficient erosion, we have a uh, slower erosion rates. With the, the, the case on the right, we have faster erosion rates, right? And so these are interesting because we can then use erosion rates to predict whether climate controls it or not. One last scenario is where we can change a little bit of that taper by creating a rigid uh, core of that mountain. This is called a rigid backstop. Um, if if uh, for some reason there is a, a fast and, and high surface uplift in the middle of the mountain, as has happened in the Andes. Yeah, this, 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 can, um, this can actually be very hard to erode back into, and so it actually may drive changes in that uh, taper. And so if we have a dry uh, scenario, an increase in, or the formation of this rigid backstop will uh, change the taper and make it the back arc wider. Whereas if we have the opposite effect, we will get a shorter back, um, back arc region. And the interesting thing to look for here is differences in the shortening rates. And in the wetter side, we would get, again, faster shortening rates and faster erosion rates, right, in, in the wetter scenario. Okay, so we have a few end members, right, to look for. 
Um, so we can think about if there are width adjustments, if we expect climate to control erosion, we should expect faster erosion rates uh, coinciding with changes in climate, um, with uh, higher precipitation environments. And we should expect to see topographic and climate relationships as well, like the form of the mountain. Um, for uh, if there is topographic adjustments um, to, to these uh, widths with fixed width origin, so that pure vertical uplift scenario, we should expect uh, mountain asymmetry to correlate with the to correlate with the orographic effects. And so we can look for these things in the Andes. But if we don't see any of it, so if there is no climatic control, we should then ask ourselves, what controls the asymmetry of the Andes? And so this is what we can look for. We can look for uh, slab-related controls on the tectonic styles. So basically the subduction zone parameters here, uh, because these are uh, the parameters that can actually control uh, the amount of mass and the direction of mass that is being added to the Andes origin. So here I'm going to show you some, uh, some of my work related to trying to address this question. And so again, the diagnostic climate signal would be here in the southern central Andes, uh, we should expect differential erosion rates uh, coinciding with changes in, in precipitation. And so here we are in the southern part of the central Andes, so we're just coming off of the Altiplano Plano Puna Plateau. And over here, this is a blow up of that small box over there. I looked at some catchments along strike of the Andes, right? And these catchments are colored in blue for the Chilean side and red for the, the, the Argentine side. So the dry side in that case. So now I'm gonna overlay this uh, rainfall map on top of it. And what we see is that the Chilean side, as we go southward, there's an increase in precipitation. Whereas in the Argentine side, it remains dry throughout. So this is the perfect experiment for us. So here are a couple cross sections, topographic cross sections, and we see where there's no change in precipitation on either side of the mountain. We see uh, a symmetric or near symmetric origin where the, the widths of either side of the mountain are, uh, are similar, but not quite. When we go into the region where there's a high contrast in precipitation, uh, the asymmetry go, grows uh, stronger, right? Uh, so the drier side becomes wider compared to the wetter side. So this is already a first qualitative in, indication that we're in the good, in the right direction. And so if you remember from the fixed width, fixed width scenario, if we induce uh, for pure vertical uplift, if we induce a wetter side, uh, we should drive a migration of the topographic divide and uplift in the dry side. I had an undergrad student in the group look at surface uplifts uh, uh, signals or a, a long strike of the Andes in this region. So in red, you're looking at uh, measurements of surface uplift on the dry side of the Andes and in blue, uh, surface uplift on the wet side of the Andes. If you're curious about how this is done, ask me later and I can show you how um, in concept how it is done. So Pedro actually um, looked at this and he saw that the magnitude of surface uplift not a big change in, uh, in the magnitude compared, dry, comparing dry to wet sides. There's some amount of difference here, but they cannot uh, account for the differences uh, that we see in precipitation. And the trend in, uh, in decrease in surface uplift is actually the same on both sides. So for the prerequisite of higher surface uplift, we are already starting to not see that, uh, that climate signal. Back in 2018, I showed you as well uh, this, this plot over here from some work that I did for my, my PhD where I looked at erosion rates on both sides. And uh, if re you recall from then, I showed you that uh, the erosion rates that we see as measured from cosmogenic nuclides uh, are the same on both sides despite the changes in precipitation. So going from north to south, um, south being the left part of the graph, we see the same pattern of increase to a maximum at about 34 uh, degrees south with the same amount of erosion and that decreases monotonically towards uh, southwards. Um, and so how this is measured is uh, measuring cosmogenic nuclide concentrations on 
uh, uh, river sediments. And so if, if you want to know a little bit more about that, I can show you later. I don't have time to go through it right now. But basically what we see is the same erosion rate, wet and dry. And so, um, so, so then this indicates, well, we, we expected to see faster erosion rates on the, on the wet side. And so could this be just a local effect or some, uh, could I be, these conclusions be restricted by the uh, of spatial distribution of my samples? So in this case, let's look at erosion rates for the entire Andes that we have. We have more than 350 samples for the Andes. And so here's a map of all these uh, river basins. Uh, so at least the sampling points for the river basins distributed all along the Andes, right? And so what I did is I, I uh, compile all this data using, um, uh, using a compilation that they're uh, for, with more than 3,000 data points around the globe. And I collected just the ones for, for the Andes. Um, and then we can start then asking this question about, is this a symmetry related to differences in erosion? So what we could look for then is to, to see if there are uh, erosion and rainfall relationships. First thing that I did was look at the morphology or the topography, right? What we see here on this graph is a plot of the hill slope gradients. So basically within this basin, we're seeing how steep uh, these hill slopes are versus how steep the rivers are as opposed to the slopes, right? And so if uh, we should expect normally this positive between the two, but if you pay attention, these dots are colored by precipitation. And what we see is that um, there is a concentration of the higher precipitation dots on the left side of this dot cloud. And as we go towards higher steep river steepness, we are also migrating into drier landscapes, right? So it's, it's yellower on the left and bluer on the right. And so if I just qualitatively uh, collect a band over here in this uh, and, and look at what the relationships are between these topographic metrics and precipitation, what we see is a negative relationship with river steepness and a positive relationship with hill slope gradient. So this is telling us that the drier the landscape is, the steeper the rivers are, but the, the steeper, uh, the shallower the slopes of the river are. So this is kind of counterintuitive. We, the, the one on the left here is actually expected. So if re you recall from that equation, the river steepness, which is this KSN metric over here, is uh, the ratio of the, the, uh, the amount of uplift that is happening on the landscape divided by the erosional efficiency. So by looking at this, increasing P, already we can think of if we maintain U and K fixed, we should expect a decrease in KSN. And this is exactly what we see here. Um, and so uh, basically what this is telling us is that there is a, a, an imprint of climate on the topography, but it doesn't necessarily have to control the mass, right? So we, if we can look now in terms of uh, the erosion rates themselves, what we see is a strong correlation with how steep the topography is. This is a well-known relationship in cosmogenic nuclide data, right? The steeper topography is, the faster the erosion rates are, or the faster uh, the uplift rates are, right? But when we look at precipitation, there is a very weak relationship here. So here is... Um, here is uh, the, the relationship between erosion rates and rainfall rates for all these basins. Uh, and now if we bin each of these basins based on how much it rains, so in intervals of zero to 250 millimeters a year, and then 250 to 500 millimeters a year, so on and so forth, what we see is a strong correlation between erosion and rainfall for the driest of landscapes. And that as we increase precipitation, incrementally, uh, we don't see that, that correlation drops out very quick, okay? And so rain actually probably matters for the driest of landscapes, but once we reach that, that semi-arid to temperate climate, it doesn't matter anymore. Uh, increases in precipitation won't drive increases in erosion rates. At least this is what these correlations are showing us, right? And so now, um, answering that question, well, we're, we're lacking a mechanism, right? We're lacking erosion rates and their correlation, correlation with climate. 
So now we can then ask, where does this asymmetry come from? Okay. It turns out that, um, that the age of the Nazca plate, there's a, as it gets older towards, towards the center of the Andean subduction zone, the South American Nazca plate, Nazca plate subduction zone, topography gets higher. Okay. And so um, folks have observed this before and said, okay, so the age of the Nazca plate, because of its controls on the subduction velocity of the Nazca plate, uh, drives higher topography in the Andes. And so we can then now ask if the morphology of the Andes, the distribution of where the Andes is in, uh, uh, in its distance from the trench, if that is actually controlled by the slab age and the slab geometry itself. We know those things control uh, how origins evolve. And so we have conceptual models here. I showed you these models before, where we have changes in precipitation on either side of the mountain. We should have uh, the expectation is for changes in the morphology. But then there are also tectonic members. If we change the geometry of the Nazca plate, we should change where, uh, where deformation is happening within the origin as well. And if we make it thicker, also, it should drive uh, faster subduction rates, and it also, because of that, requires stronger forces in the overriding plate to balance that subducting uh, velocity, right? And so what I did is also, also uh, just before I show you what I did, I, uh, this is a map, uh, a cross section of the Andes in two different places uh, at five degrees and at 35 degrees south, uh, and showing you the geometry of the orogenic wedge. What we, can, what we can see and conclude from these graphs is that once we change the geometry of the Nazca plate from a shallow subduction to a steeper subduction, you can see that the propagation of deformation into the back arc region uh, changes a lot. And so during flat subduction, we get a, a wider origin uh, into the back arc there's lots of deformation happening on the toes of the mountains. And when we go into a, a scenario with a normal angle subduction, so higher around 20, 25, 30 degrees uh, subduction angles, what we get is that typical shape of the orogenic wedge. Where it's shorter, the mountains are at some, um, at, are, are farther from the trench, and uh, the, 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 the length of the back arc basins uh, or the back arc uh, regions are also smaller, okay? So we can look for these things in the shape of the origin. So what I did was um, uh, I took the, the width of the origins throughout the Andes in, in these cross sections marked in black over here. Uh, I took the width of the origin from the trench all the way out to the back arc deformation front. And I then, um, I used the distance between the trench to the mountain peaks. The ratio between these two metrics gives me an asymmetry of the origin, which I then compared to the amount of rain on one side compared to the other, right? So um, what, what this looks like in terms of data, this is a topographic profile where I get uh, the asymmetry uh, by finding the peak of the mountain mass and, uh, and over this normalized math uh, uh, origin width. Where it falls within this normalized origin width gives me a asymmetry, in this case about 0.38. So this means that uh, a value less than 0.5, the origins are closer to the trench. So what we see in terms of precipitation here, uh, now this is the rainfall ratio. What it's showing us is values bigger than zero are uh, showing us that the pro wedge side of the mountain, so the, the ocean facing side of the mountain is wetter, uh, where negative values are showing us uh, that the retro wedge is wetter, okay? So if we go in this direction and we then increase the asymmetry, this is exactly what we would expect for a climate signal. So this positive correlation is going in the direction that we would expect, right? Uh, mountains closer to the back arc deformation front are coinciding with wetter uh, pro edges. Sort of the wedge, uh, sort of the pro edge here, the rain, uh, the wetter side pushing the mountains farther away, basically. Um, and the opposite is also true. So the, if it rains more on the retro wedge, we see mountains closer 
to the trench. So basically, again, pushing it in the opposite direction. But we need to control for the other tectonic variables first, right? So we have slab age and we have uh, uh, slab dips, right? Both of them have strong correlations with the origin asymmetry. So if I assume a multilinear model, just like the one over here, right? And I control for the effects of each of these variables on asymmetry. After controlling for that, what we see is that we get rid of the relationship with climate signals, so the ratio of rainfall, and the, uh, the relationship with the tectonic metrics are actually, uh, they remain strong. And so what we can see is that after controlling for the tectonic controls of orogenic uh, asymmetry, there's no leftover asymmetry to be explained by climate. And so this has important implications because we know that the slab geometry and age changes through time, right? And as they change through time, what we can see is that there are differences in the amount of deformation that happens in the orogenic wedge. And so by changing, if it controls also the position of the mountain, perhaps changing uh, the slab angles through time can also drive mountains to be closer or farther from the trench over time as well. And there are numerical models that have shown, um, uh, the, that have modeled uh, geodynamically uh, this whole system and have shown that the slab dips change, might change cyclically over time, okay? So perhaps the mountains also move according to these changes in slab dips. Okay, so this was the first part. I only have 10 minutes, uh, 10 minutes more of a talk, so don't worry too much, I won't extend myself. Uh, and the question was, do orographic uh, rainfall actually, does it control uh, orogenic asymmetries? And the answer is uh, basically no, uh, but only if after accounting for the tectonic variables, um, if there is still some amount of unexplained asymmetry, which we do not observe for the Andes. So the second part, this is a short part, uh, is about mountain heights, right? So um, do, do, do changes in climate towards the pole, colder climates can they drive faster erosion rates and limit the heights of mountains? Um, what we can do is turn to our critical taper again. We can look for that model, uh, the, the predictions of the, the that, uh, mass balance model of the heights of mountains. So what I'm, I'm gonna show you here is that uh, what these models predict is that if we have a given accretionary flux, right, uh, and a given erosion rate uh, in equilibrium, through time, erosion rates should remain the same. Therefore, the heights of the mountains should remain the same. So as we increase convergence rate, what we should expect is an increase in elevation, okay, for different end member scenarios, right? Um, and the shape of this curve is actually dictated by some powers here de determined analy analytically by these authors over here, okay? Uh, it turns out that if we decrease the erosional efficiency, that is, we, um, we actually make uh, erosion less efficient, we need wider and taller origins. So we would expect uh, orogenic wedges to follow the steeper curve. On the other side, if we make erosion more efficient, we would expect origins to go along this lower curve over here. So we can then uh, look for relationships between convergence rates and elevation and populate this whole uh, elevation convergence rate space to look for changes in erosional efficiency according to these predictions, right? And so the interesting thing about doing this is that um, recently it's been observed, for example, for uh, different subduction zones in widely different climates uh, that the maximum elevation or the maximum mean elevation of origins is pretty well correlated with the forces necessary to support the subduction uh, mega thrust, right? And so the amount of force that you need to balance the force of the subduction zone system is directly correlated, irrespective of climate, with the elevation of that mountain, right? This is expected uh, based on force balance calculations. But we still have this, uh, this 
pattern of change and elevation towards the poles that coincides marvelously with the changes in the equilibrium line altitudes uh, of, of snowfall. Okay, and so what we can do is we can use this, uh, this, this uh, framework over here of elevation versus convergence rate to solve for the changes in erosional efficiency. So again, I did this by looking at origins from Alaska all the way down to the Southern Andes um, and Patagonia as well. But Patagonia, I didn't calculate as a, as a cross section over here. You can ask me about that later. Uh, so I looked at the topography of all these uh, subduction zones, again, collecting maximum and mean elevations on uh, a cross strike and uh, use their convergence rates to assess for these changes in erosional efficiency. So I'm gonna start populating the space. We can see Alaska over here. I'm just gonna start filling in with the origins that we have. So British Columbia, uh, here is the, the Altiplano, parts of um, Central America actually over here, down here, and the Altiplano up here, uh, and then the remainder of the Andes. Okay, so there's a lot of scatter here. Let me color a few things more. So uh, in red outlines, we're seeing uh, origins that are affected by flat slabs. That means the angle of the subduction is pretty low. Um, and then we can then fit, uh, do uh, apply a regression, a nonlinear regression to through the entire data set. What it ends up showing is that Obviously, by the amount of scatter, we have a poor uh, explain, um, the, the global fit actually explains only 20% of that distribution. But um, the exponents that we expected to see are actually within the range of that predicted by analytical uh, solutions to that mass balance equation. And so um, there are a couple interesting things here to maybe help us explain this poor fit. One thing that we can look for is why is erosional efficiency low in Alaska? It's supposed to be high because of the glaciers. Well, for, for one part, what we would expect with higher uh, glacial uh, erosion is that it decreases the mean elevation because of the high erosion rates. But actually by isostasy, there is an isostatic uplift of the peak of these mountains, right? So that could explain the maximum elevation of that uh, of Alaska being way too high for its convergence rate over here. But there's also one thing, the, the Alaska uh, is situated, the Alaskan ranges are situated on top of this th over thickened crust, the Yakutat terrain that was subducted underneath um, these mountains. And so what we can do is we can grab the isostatic relationships between the elevation and crustal thickness uh, we can see that Alaska is plotting way off that curve or the expected curve based on isostasy, and we can apply that, correlate, that correction uh, down to where it should lie, uh, basically by removing the elevation that is uh, related to 25 kilometers of extra crust. By doing so, Alaska falls down to that curve, and when we look at the relationships uh, of removing that elevation, um, because of the Yakutat crust, what we get is that Alaska falls within um, that range of the global fit. And we improved uh, to an R squared of 0.35, and we can see that our global fit crosses through um, origins that are in drastically different climates. So here I'm showing absolute latitude. So the same fit crosses through, uh, crosses through British Columbia, Alaska, parts of the Andes, and parts of Central America. Okay, um, the Altiplano region is as expected uh, higher than it's supposed to be uh, based on its uh, alone, based alone on its convergence rate because it's a desert basically, pretty much. So very low erosional efficiency. So now if we use this curve here as a marker for differences in erosional efficiency and normalize what we calculate in terms of where these uh, dots fall on each of these curves, right? What we see is that there's no change in erosional efficiency through, uh, throughout differences in latitude, right? So, um, so what, what I did here is basically I'm just calculating an erosional efficiency based on where these elevations fall on the map, on the graph, and normalizing it by the global fit. And there's no change related to, uh, to latitude, right?
And so uh, basically what this is telling us is that uh, there's, no, there's no effect of the, the poleward uh, direction of increasing in, um, in erosional efficiency by glaciers. And basically that convergence rates or the tectonic end member explains the elevation uh, the elevation of mountains. We don't need climate to explain it. There are variations and I can discuss those if you want to know more, but I don't have to, any time to go into it right now. So this is the take home points. Uh, so basically erosion rates and rainfall are not well correlated. We don't see any uh, correlation related to that. And the asymmetry, both the asymmetry and elevation of mountains are, are, uh, can be easily explained by uh, the tectonic end members, i.e the convergence rates or the slab related metrics okay so this is what i had to show you thank you very much for your time um and i'm happy to take any questions thank you pedro so you. so so people can ask questions just unmute yourself or if you're a little shy you can just type it into the chat and i'll, I'll relay it on to pedro uh, steve if i may no one's ever accused me of being shy so Pedro, I have two questions, one of, them, one of which will expose my ignorance, and the other is, I, I think, perhaps a, a more substantive question. Could you go back to your slide that showed the two cross sections for the Andean tectonic system at oh, yeah. five degrees and 35? Yeah. Is there something here that just didn't, intuitively doesn't seem right to me? And I'm sure there's a reason. Um, I noticed that the magmatic arc in the flat slab is closer to the subduction which is exactly the opposite of what I would expect. Yes. I mean, you've got to get down to 150 kilometers to start the melting, and here you've got it with a flat slab, you've got the magmatic arc much closer to the subduction zone, the, yeah. the trench anyway, than the steeper, which should get down there faster. What's the explanation for that? Absolutely, that's a good, a very good uh, observation. If you, if you look closely here, um, in these flat slabs, you actually don't have an active ma magmatic arc. This, it says over here inactive. So it turns out that when you get to the shallowest of subductions, right, uh, subduction angles, uh, what you get is the deactivation. You don't get um, magmatism anymore. It actually, you can see that in the, in the rock record in these mountains. Uh, and, but you're, you're correct that um, if, if we're not reaching that uh, situation where it's flat enough to uh, deactivate the magmatic arc, it should correlate. And it actually does. If you look at global compilations of this, changes in slab angles are correlated with the distance between the trench and the magmatic arc. And if you take the, there are some recent metrics, one of which is called the uh, radius of curvature of the subducting mm -hmm. plate. The, the wider that radius is, so the, the basically the, the more, the wider the curve of the subduction it makes, the farther away the magmatic, magmatic arc oh. is. So there is a strong correlation there. Here, what happens is you deactivate it, um, you concentrate uh, deformation in the back arc region, okay? So when you have a low subduction angles, you actually prop up the the mm -hmm. core of the range and you propagate that formation into the back arc region so it just doesn't have the magmatic arc anymore okay, interesting Active. thank you the other the other question um when you're talking about mass transfer yeah in your in your models you've got the advection is basically lateral it's horizontal you've got you're moving crust in yeah but you've also got a volcanic mountain system in which you're bringing new material in from below as well. To what extent do you have to consider the volcanic contribution versus the stress-related contribution? That's right. Um, uh, that's a great question. And uh, what in this modeling effort, at least in the critical taper construct, it completely ignores the amount of mass that is added by magmatism. Okay, uh, but but what you uh, what we can see, at least in the Andes, is that. Uh, most of the deformation and the crustal shortening that you get, or the elevation that you get in the Andes, or the mass in that sense, is related to crustal shortening. It can be explained by crustal shortening. Uh, there is a little bit, a small percentage that is added by magmatism, but it cannot, it, it is actually pretty small compared to the amount that you get just by uh, shortening the crust. 
one quickie. How wide is the magnetic arc? I need it this can, for paper I'm writing. It depends. It depends on where you look. It could be, uh, you know, from you mean the whole orogenic wedge, right? Not the whole wedge, just the volcanic arc. Oh, just the, the arc. Oh, it would be. It would be at most. I would think, based on what I've seen in the Andes. Uh, it would be about, you know, maybe less than 100 kilometers. 50 kilometers, uh, 50 to 100 would be my guess. It's, it's always a pleasure listening to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. And so, Pedro, I actually have a follow-up question because I have yeah. about 25% of my, uh, geology, my historical geology students watching in right now, and they haven't learned about, you know, North American orogenies on the West Coast yet, but we will learn that. Mm -hmm. So I'm just looking at, you know, essentially having the slides still up, um, you know, do you have the southern Andes with the steeper trench and then the shallower trench in the northern Andes? Um, could you uh, relate, uh, are these are, could be analogous to some of the orogenies that we had on the west coast of North America? Like I'm looking at the southern Andes, that looks like more, a little more Nevadian perhaps. Yeah. And, and the northern one would be like a Laramide or a Sabir or something like that. What do you think? That that's right. Um, the, the, the west coast of the U.S. or the, the, the whole western margin of North America is actually really interesting. And it's where some of the interpretations of the changes in uh, what you get in the style of deformation comes from, right? So uh, depending on how wide uh, the subduction zone, the long strike, so how wide uh, of the margin the slab occupies, Right. So if it's, if it's the size of the Andes or if it's just the size of British Columbia, that actually makes a huge difference. And so in the end, um, what you get is creation of basin and range type uh, deformation where you have peaks and troughs and peaks and troughs, uh, depending on how wide uh, the, the subduction zone system is. Um, and in, in uh, the, the evolution of the Western North American ma margin, you have all these different styles acting over time. You have uh, both high angle subduction, uh, low angle subduction. You see that not only in the style of deformation, but also um, in the geochemistry of the rocks, right? So the uh, geochemistry of what is coming out through the magmatic arcs over time. You see these changes happening and um, and it changes in the sense that at some point you deactivate subduction in the western margin, right? You, trans you, you uh, uh, transform it into a transform margin, right? Like so it, it, it deactivates the subduction part of it. But it's interesting because that margin is actually a really cool place to investigate post orogenic landscapes, right? Because you just, not, not so long ago, you deactivated the subduction zone, but you still have some high topography. And it matters for us to know how fast that topography is being eroded um, because of that. I don't know if I an answered your question. I think I went on a tangent there, but. No, 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 that was great. And so, so, yeah. let me, so, so after professors gave these questions, how about the students? Okay, so anybody out there with a good question from some of the students? Yes, Professor. I had a few questions, Pedro. Thanks for a great talk. Uh, my Thank first you. question is, are there other ways climate may impact mountain building, especially since the data is showing a lacking correlation between increased rainfall and erosion rate in the Andes? Perfect question and very fitting for this kind of system. We have, um, uh, what happens actually when you, when you deactivate, for example, say you expect uh, a dry climate to not have much erosion at all, versus a wet climate to, to have erosion. And um, what, what, what ends up happening is you change the amount of sediment that is coming off the mountain and going into the trench. So in this region right here, however much erodes in the mountains up here, uh, there's some, some of that sediment will get trapped in, in between, but rivers will carry that sediment out to the ocean and part of it will get deposited within the trench. And so it turns out that if um, one of the, one of the, back in 2003, one of the biggest, uh, it was sort of a big paper that, you know, uh, 
proposed this whole climatic effect on uh, the mountain building of the Andes itself uh, with a period that you did not have much sediment being subducted. And so basically without much sediment being subducted down here, and if this is a function of climate, uh, it happens that there is uh, there's higher traction on this, um, on, on the subduction zone interface, right? And so um, you can think of the sediment as a blanket, right? And a blanket that is sort of a, 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 a lubricator of that interface. And so if you don't have sediment at all, it ends up that you, you create a lot more uh, resistance to subduction. And by doing so, you can drive uh, shortening or enhance shortening in the back arc. So in that sense, yes, there are other ways climate could actually affect. Um, and if you want to think of sediment being uh, trapped in the trench, you can also think of oceanic currents. So if you deactivate the, the long strike oceanic current along South America, the west coast of South America, you can actually uh, drive some pretty drastic changes in the style of subduction. That's very interesting. Sounds like another cool project. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's completely different, completely different take. Yeah. But, but great question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I had one other, one other question. Um, yeah. Are there any effects of climate change that could um, potentially disrupt the stability of existing mountain ranges? Disrupt the stability. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure I fully grasp what you're trying to, to, to ask, but, but I, think, I think over the time scale of mountain building, so over tens of millions of years, uh, you would need a pretty drastic change in climate to, to push this completely out of balance. Yeah. 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 So basically um, changing, uh, what I'm trying to say is changing completely the style of erosion. So uh, mm -hmm. over millions and tens of millions of years, you just go straight to, uh, to glaciers, for example. Then, then you can change completely the style or the mass balance of the mountain, depending mm -hmm. on how cold it is, how high the mountains were before that change in that climate, and so on and so forth. Okay, got it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? from students or faculty. Pedro, if I may, following up on part of your answer, we've got the Humboldt Current off yep. the west coast of South America. And that, you know, I was thinking earlier on, you were showing wind direction. You'd expect the orographic effect. You'd, you'd expect to have the rain on the west side of the Andes. But when you've got the Humboldt Current, you've got, an, you've got coastal desert. Yeah, yeah, uh, up in the north part, yes. Yeah. The so half what happens if down. the Humboldt current stops? Yeah, so, so that's, uh, some folks have actually thought about that um, and modeled it in terms of how much heat is transferred off the coast of, of South America. And it turns out that the, the position of, of where you get precipitation, that transition that I showed you uh, around basically 35 degrees or, or 33 degrees roughly when you start getting the, the higher effect of precipitation. Um, if you change how that current behaves, and in that way you're changing atmospheric circulations as well, uh, you're fluctuating the position of that transition. So at times uh, of drier climate or, or wetter climate, you can get the basically a pulsation of where uh, of precipitation so at times it's higher north at times it's further south so right there in that transition is where the humble current actually really matters uh, in terms of positioning where the transition uh, happens between uh, a, a dry climate and a wet climate so you can yeah you can you can change the climate uh, just by changing that current too and the amount of sediment that goes into the trench for sure so it is, uh, I have one more question. It's actually not even a question. So uh, in your research, you were looking at from latitude or like around 30 to 34, 35 degrees south. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's like right uh, west of uh, Mendoza. Did, did you right. go up as, as far as um, up near Pumamaca? In that area? Oh, I think, is that around? It, it, it's closer to Peru. 
Yeah, no, I, I haven't looked at that region, not here in this study, no. Okay, but, um, but, you, but you were out in the mountains, you, you were doing this research out in the field, right? Yeah, yeah, out okay. here in, in okay. southern uh, and So you know, let me just point out to like, um, to, this is, so to, to the students, this is some of the most beautiful country yeah. at the tallest mountain in the western hemisphere is located right in the study, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and yeah. so, um, so just, for, just for the record, you, you're doing some amazing research, but in really beautiful areas. Yeah, these places are, yeah, they're basically some of the most beautiful places I've been to. Um, there's, I don't know if you know this person uh, in, uh, is a famous uh, structural geologist at Cornell, uh, Rick Allmendinger. Mm -hmm. he, um, he mentions this basin right here, the one I'm pointing to. This is called the Iglesia Basin out here. And he says it's the most beautiful basin in the whole world. That's his, his words, not mine. <laughs> yeah, and it's, um, it's a beautiful country up in that area. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing research. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and, and hot too. This, this part is, uh, of the Andes has been, you know, throughout the last decade, it's just like new papers popping up every week on, uh, you know, deformation along the like basement core ranges and uh, the, yeah, the propagation, like people are doing all kinds of research here uh, related to paleontology, related to uh, geomorphology, thermochronology, you name it. Uh, it's a really fantastic place to do. And is, isn't research. there a little piece in that area, maybe it's a little north of your place, that was a piece of the, um, of uh, the Gulf of Mexico once upon a time? Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's the, what they call the exotic terrain, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. that's right, that's right. It's right around here. Okay, yeah, so it's, yeah. Um, you know, if you ever need an assistant to go out and back out to <laughs> with the wines and the mullet. I've been trying to go back there ever since 20, when was the last time, 2014, I guess. I've okay. been trying to go back there. I'll let you know if I okay. end up. <laughs> Pedro, you've got my little gray cells working overtime. Um, all these discussions have been, I mean, this has been absolutely fascinating. Uh, we're all, we're talking about continental crust. What happens in ocean, ocean subduction? Where you've got, okay. a, thinner, where you've got a thinner lithosphere. What, yeah. have you, have you started thinking about that or is that total? I've, um, the principles work. So it should behave the same pretty much. The differences would start to happen when you, um, when you have different thermal behavior of the crust. So if you're talking about two uh, drastically different uh, oceanic crusts in terms of age, that'll have a different behavior compared to two young ones, for example, subducting, right? Um, and so the relationships should be similar but the variations in heights that you get are, are uh, should they should matter more in terms of the thermal um, the thermal parameters of the crust uh, and not so much of, of of anything else. This is my my first thought to to your question. Um, you actually see different trends uh, comparing this type of Cordilleran style subduction zones in terms of convergence rates and elevations. When you when you start, you go into island arcs, then uh, it's a whole different curve. Like the data just separates out. Yeah. Thank you for the stimulation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, uh, any last questions? Yeah, just a quick one on that the, the Willet 1999 figure that you used a couple times. Um, I something that I was confusing to me um, was, yeah. Why is it that in the, like, I guess I'm confused at the, the, can you explain like the slope of each side of the mountain in each circumstance? Because is it, that's more of like a tectonic um, result than it is a weathering result, I guess. So the, the slopes are, uh, what, are you talking about the one on the left or the right? The one on the left. Oh, sorry, I guess yeah. it's, yeah. Yeah, so, so what this is showing is not the, the gray grid over here. This is, this is just the amount of mass that is removed. The actual topography is, is uh, the top of the colored domain here, okay? Mm -hmm. 
So, so the top of the color domain, you have the mountain peak right there, and it slopes downwards uh, to either side. Okay, and so that gray grid uh, that might be causing uh, some some confusion is just the amount of mass that is removed throughout the these models. So the gray grid was, you know, at the beginning of the model, there was nothing there, but as it evolved further and more and more mass was being exhumed from, from this part. And no, basically, if you sum all of this, it'll be the amount of mass that it wrote it. That makes so much sense. Yeah. Cause I just, my brain was like, that's a mountain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I uh, had the same reaction the first time I looked at this paper, but um, uh, it's just, I guess the author here wanted to show, uh, like give a visual appreciation of, you know, a comparison of the volume or at least a cross-sectional area compared to the size of the crust. So if you look at the, basically the bulk gray part, it's kind of of the same dimension as the bulk colored part. Thank you. Yeah. And so we have one, uh, one last question here from Alia. Hi Alia. So, so she goes, is there a time dependence on the relationship between tectonic erosion, tectonics, erosion, and climate? And she goes, for example, if you look at erosion on a thousand year versus hundred thousand year to two million year time scales, would you expect climate or tectonics to dominate more? That's a, a great question. That is absolutely a great question. It, uh, it's a matter of, of time scale. Um, if if you're at steady state, the answer is it doesn't matter, okay? If you're at steady state, it should not matter. The fluctuations that you get from climate cycles uh, in short time periods of tens to hundreds of thousands of years, they are just noise on top of an overall average curve, okay? So in the end, uh, it turns out that what happens in between these differences in climate cycles that are short uh, time scales uh, compared to mountain building, uh, it turns out that you might get some changes in erosion, sure. But what dictates over the, what dictates the evolution of the mountain itself is the amount of, uh, is basically the tectonic vector. Yeah. Only if you actually change climate for good. If you if you're not fluctuating it, it not fluctuating it anymore, or you are, but at a higher level uh, of intensity, let's say, uh, and you remain at the higher level of intensity, then you can start you can start uh, affecting things at different time scales. Great question. So it's uh, it's one thirty. I think that it's time to wrap up. So I want to thank you, Pedro. That was an amazing talk. I learned Thank a lot, much. I took some notes, and I hope that uh, uh, my students and everyone got a lot out of this. So thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing your, your research in the future. Yeah, so, thank yeah. you, thank you very yeah. much. Thanks for having me, it was a pleasure. Um, uh, Great yeah. to see you, Pedro. Great to see you too, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And remember, if you ever need an assistant, yes, in, uh, in Mendoza. <laughs> we'll do, we'll, we'll let you know. Well, take care. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Right. Bye, 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 everyone. I'll see you next week. Bye.